very pleased to tell you good morning. It took a lot of effort to put this together, thanks to primary to Chico Gaetani and to Fernando, who are both here and who speak. They are both from the School of Public Administration in Brasilia. My name is Paulo Sotero. I'm the director of the Wilson Center's Brazil Institute, on whose behalf I welcome you here this morning. We are honored to convene this workshop on the critical challenges facing the state in both Brazil and the United States, America's largest democracies. We are grateful uh, to the institutions that made this possible. Uh, the Brazilian National School for Public Administration, ENAP, and the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. They are both here represented by Yashim Oruk and by Walter, by, by uh, 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 Fernando and by Francisco Gaetani, who will, as I mentioned, speak during the day. Uh, I am also, and we are also particularly thankful to Walter, the Deputy Secretary of the Brazilian Ministry of Planning, uh, Development and Management, and to Yashim Baruch, the Deputy Director of the UNDP office in Washington, for agreeing to open this event. You will hear from them shortly. Uh, the concept of today's exercise was summarized by ENAP's uh, director, Francisco Gaetani, in the invitation you all received. Uh, Brazil, a young democracy celebrating the 30th anniversary of its 1988 constitution, and the U.S., an established democracy, face challenges similar in nature. Some of them transcend their national contexts, such as climate change, digital revolution, demographic transformation, and, well, the role of women in politics. Uh, others, uh, other challenges are more closely related to their institutional settings, the imperfections of representative democracy, quality of federal institutions and checks and balances between the three branches of government. In both countries, unexpected political events have produced surprising developments with respect to the future of the administrative state affecting current public management policies. State capacities are in check in both nations in the United States, political actors in the U.S. Congress, interest groups, private sector, and the policy community are questioning the current administration's management of the relationship between the White House of President Donald Trump and uh, the machinery of the executive branch. The consolidated uh, U.S. state apparatus appears to be unprepared to deal with an outsider who occupies the most important position in the government. In Brazil, a caretaker president, Michel Temer, has had to reckon with a large societal outcry against corruption spearheaded by an energized judicial establishment. The heterogeneous Brazilian federal administration moves erratically between a resilient behavior and the erosion of government legitimacy. Despite the potential common ground for policy dialogue on these challenges, there is a lack of comparative research looking at state developments in Brazil and the United States in recent decades. This workshop aims to allow an exchange of ideas and experiences between different generations of practitioners and academics. A similar exercise, by the way, is on the way in Brazil at the uh, University of Sao Paulo and other institutions, uh, and we'll bring together a group of scholars uh, there in Sao Paulo early next month. Uh, we are live on the web in this first session. 
or for the first two hours of this exercise. We will tape the procedures and post an edited version of it, of this workshop, in a couple of days. And then we will uh, also make available summaries of the presentations. With that, I would like to introduce Yashim Uruk, who is, the, as I mentioned, the Deputy Director of the United States Development Program Office in Washington. She is a national from Turkey. She has had 20 years of work, of service at the UN, has, was a representative of the UNDP in Albania, <coughs> uh, in Romania, and uh, has obviously in those positions faced very challenging situations, not dissimilar to the ones we are going to discuss here today. Uh, she has, uh, Yashim has a master's degree in Middle Eastern Studies from the American University in Cairo, Bachelor's of Arts from Yale University. Uh, she speaks English, Turkish, Arabic, German, and is learning Portuguese. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so now, uh, Walter, uh, Walter, as we say his name, Baeri, is Deputy Secretary of the, the Brazilian Ministry of Planning, Development, and Management. Uh, he uh, previously worked as a federal attorney, including as Special Advisor to the Secretary of Mines and Energy. He manages the General Coordination Office for Geology, Mining, and Mineral Transformation for the Legal Council of the Ministry of Mines and Energy. He also coordinated the preparation of bills regarding the extraction and production of petroleum natural gas in the pre-salt provinces. He was responsible for drafting the mining sector bill that is, <laughs> continues to be a subject of major discussions in Brazil. Uh, Walter has, is a graduate from the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, who is, which is, by the way, as you may, if for those who don't know that, run by Jesuits, which it's, it's is important information, uh, <laughs> is the equivalent of Georgetown here. Uh, he has a master's degree in public advocacy from the State University of Rio uh, and a master's degree in administrative law from the University Cândido Mendes. And he beats Anya Prusa, who is our associate program, because she has two master's degree. Walter has three. <laughs> so he has also a master's in tributary law from the Brazilian Institute of Tributary Studies. Uh, and uh, obviously, Walter represents what is very important for Brazil, a new generation of public, talented public servants. And this is, especially in moments like this, this is give us a lot of hope. Uh, with that, I would like to invite Yashim to uh, open this proceeding, which will be followed by Walter. Yes, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Sotero. It's a great honor and privilege to be here, and I thank you on behalf of the UNDP country office in Brazil, the leadership there, Nikki Fabianchit and Didier Trebrier, who all send their regards, could not be here on behalf of them. I thank you very much for this. Um, UNDP is deeply proud and honored to be associated with your ministry and with the um, School of Public Administration for many years now. I'd like to, if you allow me, make three points um, that, are, um, th that I hope would um, contribute to the proceedings today. The first one concerns the impact of our partnership with Brazil in terms of impact on other developing countries and the work of UNDP. As you mentioned, I've been with UNDP 20, actually 21 now, 21 years, and I think it was in the late 90s when your ministry was working on Human Development Index Atlas for Brazil. I was serving then on the border of Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, working with refugee and poverty issues. And I remember seeing that, I think it was 98 or 99, seeing that this atlas of human development, looking at half of the continent, 
and then thinking for all the countries where we're serving that we need to do exactly the same. And we were very glad that we were able to cross fertilize from the experience of Brazil and use it in other countries and use this aggregated subnational human development index work that guided the work of not only the United Nations system, but also the countries that we serve, the governments that we serve. So huge impact there. And also, Mr. Girtani, I remember you speaking in 2010 when I was already in Eastern Europe heading UNDP programs there, that development cooperation needs to have a new vision, that it's not only about the North providing assistance to the South or development organizations knowing what to do and advising countries on what to do. It's really a relationship of equal footing and that we need to really learn and, and benefit from one another. And none of us have the aspirate or, or the thought, the hubris to say we know how to solve problems and that we can solve them together. And in some ways today's event, a comparison between the two most advanced democracies, arguably of, of the world in terms of scale, um, is something that will have great impact in terms of how we think about how we work with other countries in democratic governance issues. So that was my point number one on the import of the partnership here and how it impacts the work of UNDP in 170 countries across the world. The second is the partnership with the ENOP um, and UNDP comes in the context of UNDP's commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17-something goals with multiple targets um, that world leaders have agreed to in 2015 that really underpins our work, that our, our work again in 170 countries. I understand that the partnership is about making sure that the Brazilian authorities have not only the knowledge but that they disseminate the capacities for sustainable development goals achievement at local levels. And I'm so inspired again to see that this is taken on so strongly by the Brazilian governments, but also the Brazilian people who contributed a lot to the establishment and the formation of the Sustainable Development Goals. I can't help but mention that the government of Brazil through the permanent mission in New York has championed the Pathways Initiative with New York University together with the governments of Switzerland and Sierra Leone in advocating and advancing the study of governance, the governance goal under uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, which is got the famous goal number 16, including responsive account accountable public administration and civil service. Um, and we thank the government of Brazil for that. But not only in the global context, locally in Brazil, we also received the um, national voluntary report of Brazil on the sustainable development report, uh, on the sustainable development goals last year. And it's a remarkable achievement how it's been institutionalized in your government. Um, and we hope that we'll be able to share the work on sustainable development goals advancement of Brazil for the benefit of other countries. And indeed, we have a partnership on that where we quote unquote export our partnership to other parts of, of, of the world, especially Lusophone Africa. Um, the third and final point I'd like to make is on um, gender parity. And thank you so much, Mr. Sotero, for mentioning that. Um, together with the Wilson Center, actually, we have a partnership. The UNDP has a partnership on women in public service where we collect data, analyze data, comparing 130 countries on how they advance women and how, how women are participating in public service, ranging from political uh, elected office to public administration. And I really hope that in the deliberations today and in the future um, iterations of this, as you mentioned, locally in, in Brazil, that the issue of gender parity receives the attention that it should and, and, and how that in turn contributes to achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Once again, I'm so proud to um, be uh, here in this distinguished panel and, and to thank you all for the partnership and to reiterate and assure the um, partnership and the commitment of my organization to your efforts going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, yes, and, and I would like to now pass the floor to Walter. Uh, you have the little PowerPoint clicker here. <coughs> it, it works most of the time. Okay, <laughs> we'll test it for you. It's working. It's working fine. So, thank you. Thank you very much for being here. It's a privilege to, for me to be here. And I thank the Wilson Center in the person of Paul Sotero. And I. I think it's just the beginning. 
we need to share experience and sharing experience is the key factor of development and no no one can develop develop a country without sharing experience and this is the only way of it i'll excuse myself because if something sounds strange in my talking it's probably because the information is in portuguese and i try to translate it it's not that common to speak in english but i'll try to do my best effort i'll <coughs> i'll try to bring uh, to you to such a qualified people um, what what we we've been through this two past years we've just uh, came from our worst economic crisis ever. Brazil never faced an economic crisis like that. So uh, it's a challenging scenario and we are improving our results as you will see. I'll try to, to keep in my 15 protocol minutes. And so our economic recovery had key factors. We are growing uh, in 2018 and we, we grew in 2017, ending uh, economic uh, cycle, as I said, the, w the worst crisis ever. And we have signals of economic recovery and, and they are solid. That doesn't mean that we don't face many challenges. We actually have many problems in, in our budget to accommodate the public expenditures. And the key factor for uh, sustainable development and the sustainable growth in Brazilian GDP is to make the reforms that we need to continue growing. But in the past two years, we have these overall pictures. As I said, this represents our worst economic crisis in terms of GDP. And uh, in 2017, we, we begin to grow again our GDP. And those are markets projections of this week, so it's aligned with the market. And as you can see, we are, uh, we are beginning a growth path, uh, a growth path and we, we need to keep it sustainable. As you see, we, we lost many jobs, many formal jobs, and these numbers also capture a uh, percentage of uh, informal labor occupation, but uh, it represents what Brazil has in the labor market, and as you see, we, in, in this year, we are creating jobs again. So we lose many jobs and huge working force are now uh, unemployed. So uh, this is a, a, a key factor. Creating jobs is a challenge in, in a scenario that we, we kept the four uh, years of economic crisis uh, uh, of um, unprecedented effects. So, Brazil has strong monetary grounds. As you can see, we are we, we adopted and have a, a successful inflation target regime. So, we we'll, this this year we we'll have a, a low inflation, which shows signals of a healthy economy, and real interest rates are falling since we adopted a uh, uh, more intelligent economic policy to overcome this crisis, as you may see. And what is strange about this crisis is we, we, we needed to elevate our interest rates in the most terrible time of economic crisis because of inflation. So it was something of anti-cycle policy, but now we are beginning to have a, a healthy real interest rates in Brazil. And that 
reflects on the stock ex exchange. Uh, the stock exchange is at the highest point of our, our recent history, and uh, as you can see, it's just going up, and it, re it ref reflects the, 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 the policy economy and the success of it. And also, our trade balance is at record high, so it's all also a strong signal of economic recovery. So, um, if you s if you see very aspects of our economy, you can check that we have uh, strong grounds for a sustainable economic growth. So. Uh, and we have also external financial needs covered totally by, by foreign investments. And this is since 2009, so we have uh, a different background from other countries. I think the situation in other countries of Latin America is more challenged, challenging, like Argentina. Argentina has a, a more challenging situation. And also because of that, we have stable international reserves for the past six years, in, in its in its highest level, we have uh, 383 billion dollars of of national reserves. So, uh, and it's not falling; we are not using it. So, we we have a, a better situation than other countries in our region, but we also have big challenges, and that's what I'm going to talk about right now. We, we to, to, as I said, to continue our economic recovery, we need to do um, really a lot of things, and that's why it's precious to share experience and to learn from you and to learn from U.S. U.S. has more in common with Brazil than we can imagine. We are culturally very close. We, we, we have an open country and we have a tradition and and not so nowadays in in US but we we have a, a tradition of multilateralism and, and uh, a strong tradition of the use of soft power as a key factor to the world development but we need to do a fiscal consolidation uh, consolidation structural reforms and and to improve and to increase public and private partner partnership because I'll, I'll show that our budget is at the limit of investment we have um, very very short space for investment so we need to we need the 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 private sector he helping brazil for the development in, in it and that's a key factor for a sustainable development and we need to improve our regulatory framework and business environment. I think in the two last years, that was the main focus of the government. We are focused on, on, uh, on improving and making a, a more friendly environment for businesses and an entrepreneurs in Brazil for investment. And what we already, already done, we we adopted a new fiscal regime, uh, which is an expenditure cap, so um, the size of the state will not grow forever. And that's a common issue um, that Brazil and U.S. face. And, and U.S. has a, a huge deficit and they're trying to, to control the expenditures. And it's in the constitutional level because we have a constitution that is uh, that has has everything everything in brazil is con constitutionalized and it's a problem because if we want to change it uh, structurally we we need to change our constitution because we have a constitution that talk it uh, at all in the transitions of the military regime to the democracy and it was that way to avoid the 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 executive branch and to uh, to, to weakness and to to weaken the the the, the fundamental rights and the, the structure of the state. So 
Uh, that's a problem, but uh, as I said, we we changed the constitution to 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 set a expenditure cap, so we not grow uh, forever our state. Uh, we are trying to modernize uh, our public management, and it's related with electronic government. We are we have uh, 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 strong confidence that the future to 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 uh, give to the population a better public service is to uh, advance in electronic government in new ways to to bring to the population the public uh, the public service that they deserve so uh, we are investing our efforts in in providing that we have and uh, nowadays 50 public services that are 100% uh, online and available for the population and in the end of the first year uh, of the next year we expect to have more than 250 uh, public services uh, online based and, and with universal access um, as you as you may know we we have a, a population that have access to internet in 90 90 percent of it so 90 percent is covered by by internet and and have uh, access to it so it's a, a good way to provide a uh, better public service and i think we need to focus on that in in the next years we want to to mo the modernization of state enterprise management and as you know, as you may know, the state enterprise management, um, they were in the center of our, um, our corruption scandals. So we need to change the governance, we need to change the environment, we need to change the way the, the, the public uh, budget and the public allocation of, of expenditures is, is made to to get a sustainable development so uh, these projections and it's consolidated in, in 2017 in 2018 we are observing just like that in terms of gdp our expenditures are expected to decline as i said we changed our constitution to 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 make a rule of uh, expenditure cap so uh, we we are expecting our expenditures to decline uh, that way in terms of GDP. So, but we have many fiscal challenges also because fiscal challenges involve both both expenditures and revenues, and uh, we face difficult because of the economic crisis with the revenues. But uh, this year we are observing that the revenues are uh, uh, are growing and growing consistent consistently with our economic recovery, and the fiscal crisis and the end of the the easy money of the government um, brings the government has a benefits of bring to the government the responsibility, and we need to allocate uh, more efficiently. Every, every, uh, every hell we, we, we get from the public. So we are searching ways of uh, using the money more efficiently and this pass with more efficient allocation and public uh, private partnerships. At the same time, the federal government uh, implements an agenda of, of public modernization, as I said, uh, based in in the electronic government i think the future of the government is to improve the the electronic provided service for the whole population it's and it's the the only way to overcome poverty in a country like brazil with a huge territory and many regional differences and many regional inequality that's our uh, uh, real challenge 
to to uh, when when people ask me about Brazil, I, I say which Brazil? We have many countries in in one country, and we have uh, uh, the developed developed and industrial Brazil that that has a, 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 a competitive uh, aerospace um, company and and has a s strong industrial grounds, and we have people in below of the line of misery who, who, who really strong and how to deal with that kind of Brazil reflects the development of the world. We have regional uh, development difference that can, I if we face it and if we create a model, a sustainable growth model and a way to, to overcome this, I this ter territorial inequality, probably it will be a model replicable to the world. So Brazil uh, uh, is a case to be studied and, and if we overcome, and I hope we will, uh, our, our challenges, the world also can, can do that because we reflect this uh, regional inequality in our territory. So this is graphically what are our challenges. It's the, the net uh, expenditures in 2017, and as you may see, 53.2% of it is our social security expenditures, public servant, uh, 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 public servants, uh, retirement, and patients, and other social benefits. So um, if we project that that expenditure by the time and by the next years, uh, you notice that the money will get sh really shorter for new investments, and we need th those investments to improve uh, the, the, the basis of, of uh, uh, sustainable development, to invest in education, to invest in, in healthcare, and basically in education, because uh, there is no way of development without education. There is no way to sustain a democracy without education. Education is the key factor for uh, a strong democracy. People well informed will um, will certainly provide a better government and a more efficient government. So, and how do you deal with that? With the with uh, more than half of our budget uh, in expenditures with social security, basically, it, it, is, it exists. So that's our main, f main, uh, uh, main challenge. And we need, we need to, to show this year we will face elections and uh, it's very important to show to the next government how important it is to change and to make uh, structure, structural reforms to achieve uh, a better future as a nation. So uh, this is another, another way to, to show it. Uh, we, the, the deficit of the social security system is growing. So uh, we need to urgently uh, change the social security framework, legal framework, uh, to survive and to to have a more sustainable budget, Th those are our challenges, as you may see here. Uh, th those are the revenues related with social security. So uh, you have a, a, a growing deficit, and that's because our population age pattern is changing and changing rapidly. We are getting older, and uh, this is not a problem that Brazil faces, many, many nations in the world faces, but in Brazil it's dramatically. It, we are aging very fast, as you may see. Uh, so the, the population age pattern is, is radically changing, and uh, as you may see in 2030, there'll be 18.6% uh, of the population. So uh, it's not sustainable uh, to have a, a, a social security regime uh, with growing deficits in the, the medium long term. So 
uh, and I mean by, uh, I'll correct myself, I mean by, by long term, next year. <laughs> Next year we'll face real real problems with we we don't make the structural reforms that we need. So uh, this is our uh, this reflects these issues uh, as the, the 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 social security deficit grows. Also, the general government gross debt uh, is growing. So we have a. Uh, uh, intergeneration problem. We are uh, we are uh, increasing our debit deficit to pay for the 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 social security of the old people of this generation. So the 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 challenge is we we need to invest in young people to have a sustainable growth. And how can we do that if we are uh, expanding more than we can with this social security system. So uh, that's our main challenge. But we, it's with the, the expenditure cap, it will stabilize in 2021. And if, if we make the reforms that we need, uh, before that we can, we can have a surplus in, in our budget. So, so uh, this reforms are really important. So this reflects what I said in public private sector partnership. We we are expected th those are uh, contracted uh, projects. So already we, we are uh, already uh, signed the contract. So we have 42.1 billion dollars in expected investments in public-private sectors par partnerships, which helps the the, the expenditures of the government for sure, and, and to provide a better environment with better infrastructure, many <coughs> infrastructure sector. And we have uh, more than 39.4 billion dollars in investments in expected investments in ongoing projects. So. We, we we probably will will have a uh, biding process this year uh, attracting more than 39.4 billion dollars so we are doing our ho homework but partially we need to to improve st structure structural reforms and this is our priority agenda uh, above it all of course it is the 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 agenda of of the social security reform, because without that, we will we'll have uh, serious problems in, in our next year's budgets. But we need tax simplification and uh, social contribution reform, and it's related to the social security reform. Um, we already sent the bill to the Congress to bring our cent central bank autonomy. They, they have autonomy uh, as a as a, a a practice, but uh, not by the law, and, and we we are we are bringing the central bank autonomy. We we are uh, working with the Congress to have a new legal framework for tenders and public procurements, and basically to, to w our legislation is from the nine the the nine C's, so we we need to change that. Uh, new public fi finance law related with the challenges w within our budget situation. Uh, the regulation of civil ser servant salaries, it's responsible for the, the second highest expenditure in the Brazilian federal government. And it's also a factor of deficits in the state level. So we need to change the, the regulation of civil servants salaries and we hope this is, is this will uh, expire other states to adopt the same the same structure to reduce uh, uh, civil service expenditures and and to to have more efficient governments business improvement improvement and recovery uh, program of state stated always companies 
new, uh, new real estate purchase con contracts law related to, uh, to, uh, to, the, to a good environment for businesses, Privali privatization of Electrobras, uh, which is our biggest um, power company, uh, and the straightening of regulatory agencies. So um, soon we will have a, 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 a Brazil Investment Forum, May 29 and, and 30 in São Paulo, Brazil. And last year it was a, a huge success. President Temer, Temer he himself will, will be speaking, and and many of our ministers will be that um, dialoguing and talking with the the private sector about our challenges and ways to attract investments in Brazil. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Walter. Uh, do you have any comments, any observation that you would like to make? I have a couple, but I would like to hear from you first. Juliano. Juliano Basile is from Valor Economic newspaper. Just, just a second, if you know, let me get the mic. Yeah, there are people watching. Yeah. Nice to hear you. Uh, I, I used to cover in, in Brasilia, but, but now I am I'm living here. So I would like to know also, uh, what are you expecting for the elections in Brazil? What is going to happen with the economy? Are you worried with, with this process of election that, that is going to start? I'm not asking who is going to win or what is going to happen, but uh, but I, I would like to know if the, the reform of the economy could continue in d during this process. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe putting in another way, uh, are those issues being debated by the people that want to govern the country? Me make one observation. You know, I like to make. The, I'm a journalist, so I like to make things personal, um, because that's the best way to understand it. I learned this throughout my career, but especially in 1994 when I covered the best event I ever covered in my life, which was the uh, UN conference on population in Cairo, mm -hmm. where, and the issue was reproductive rights. You know, it's. You, picture the way you went it, but it was about who governs the body of a woman. And there was the fundamentalist, Islamic people, and the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And I am Catholic. Uh, basically uh, taking this very, very sort of, I would say, conservative position. And the conference was a revelation because you could not understand the issue without talking about what it was about. Uh, who governs a woman's body? <laughs> Has the state, or where is freedom here? It, it is, I like to take things to the personal level because I think it helps to understand issues. On, in this, for instance, uh, Walter talked about social security reform. Here, here's an aposentado in Brazil. I am a retired person in Brazil. In Brazil, I retired at 59 years and a half uh, after working for forever, since I was 15. Um, I am 68. In Brazil, 59 years, I retired. Here in the United States, uh, I will wait for another two years to retire from the Social Security. Why? In the United States, they tell me I can retire already because I am my age group the minimum age is 66. But they tell me that if I stay work, if I work for another four years, they will add 8% to my pension every year. And it's 8% over 8%. Or it's in the end between what I would have received in no. right, it's mm -hmm. when I turn 66 and what I will receive when I am 70, uh, it will make, it will be 50% more. And the obvious then the Social Security uh, Service ha hopes that I die, right? Because that <laughs> solves a lot of problems. And that's another incentive for you. The message is, you know, do the right thing, stay healthy, exercise, eat reasonably, and keep going. 
because, but this is, I think it's the type of comparison. In Brazil, there is a lot of difficult under, uh, explaining to people that maybe they should delay uh, uh, retirement. Another thing on a positive side, I recently renewed my Brazilian passport. Just to go to what you said in terms of uh, e-government, and there are lots of interesting things happening under the radar. Uh, I was an office boy when I started at 13, dealing with bureaucracy in Brazil. We have, we have things that are amazing <laughs> to complicate people's lives. Uh, nowadays, there are reforms. You can get documents in Brazil in a very efficient way now. And my experience, I like to share this because I was very impressed. I went to, uh, I applied online to my new passport, went to the consulate, and it took exactly 24 minutes wow. from the time I arrived, from the time I left with my new passport. And if I wanted, I could have received it at home. Because I just, you know, I like the people there, I just want to go and <laughs> see some people. But, so this is an example that there are, you know, amidst all those challenges, there are positive things happening. And I, I think Sheik uh, uh, was mentioning, Gaetani was mentioning this outside just before we started. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, any comments, any observations? Yeah, you. I will answer the, the question, and, and as you, as a, as a good journalist, it's, it's a tough question, a difficult one. And good journalists ask. Uh, difficult questions. I think um, it our election scenario is pretty much unpredictable, but uh, that's uh, the the what I talked about is above it all. I think we will continue to to have an economic um, growth and, and and an economic reform agenda because uh, we need that. The next president, no matter what the party uh, he, he came from, he will need that. He will need that to govern. <laughs> and it's simple like that. And uh, no, matter, no matter who wins, I think this is, this is an agenda uh, that is above the, the, the parties and and uh, and the uh, elections itself, and our challenge as a uh, uh, public servants, and we represent uh, uh, public servants that are uh, that are in, in, in political appointed uh, positions, but we are not we are not politicians. So Brazil has a strong bureaucracy that will keep going in our. Mm -hmm. in our uh, uh, economic reform. So I believe that. I believe that we are pretty much mature in this field and we will have the, all the, 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 the bureaucracy uh, helping to, to, to bring to the next president this agenda. So that's what I think about. And as Paulo noted and said, uh, we we are improving. I I I I usually say when when I speak that in Brazil we are so big, so huge that we do what is basic. I I'm just talking about the basic. So I think the next president will do the basic agenda, and with we do the basic, it's a revolution in terms of Brazil, <laughs> and and I I'm used to talk that and every time I talk I talk. Oh, Let's do the basic, and we are so huge that, and with a strong monetary grounds and strong uh, uh, economic features that we will we'll probably, if we do the basic, and I believe we'll do, uh, uh, we'll, we'll be successful. Well, um, any, yes, please, uh, well, no. Pedro Malan used to say, the finance minister used to say that our main challenge is to be normal. <laughs> <laughs> Brazil needs to be a normal country. <laughs> 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 Just to 
the basic thing. Yeah, do the basic. Will be a revelation. <laughs> you will be. As you said, we we are we are making uh, little revolutions. Yeah. Uh, we when we improve electronic government, you said passport is one of the public service. Uh, you you imagine uh, trading trading cattle, trading cattle cattle. We we, we are the the the. the Top exporter of the world in, in Meat. uh, of yeah. meats and, and, and cattle and protein related products, and all, all of that. A uh, few months ago, uh, d d you need to to do it uh, in paper. You, you need to sign paper, go to 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 a public office, and expect to have a, a, a response. And now it's a hundred percent online. Even your pets, if you if you want to to bring your pet to the United States, you just need to go online to take a uh, 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 veterinary uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 ret veterinary report and uh, uh, put it online, and uh, you'll be fine to 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 bring your pet to U.S. And it's a process that uses it to. You 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 needed at least we 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 calculated that you needed before that uh, two months to just to bring your pet to the U.S. for example, and okay. now it's <laughs> 30 minutes. So I think we are uh, improving our our. Yes, uh, I think we have a question. So, um, Walter, m my name is Edwin Lau. I'm with the OECD. A few weeks ago, my team, Barbara Ubaldi, and my boss, uh, Marcos Monturi, were uh, with you in Brasilia to talk about digital government in Brazil. And so they came back very enthusiastic with lots of ideas. And here I see it's reflected also in your presentation about all of the potential for digital for service delivery. But I was wondering to what extent you're also looking at digital for revenue uh, in terms of reducing the gray economy and trying to improve uh, tax collection. You know, as you say, fiscal sustainability is both about expenditure but also about revenue collection. And so I think that data analytics, uh, big data, is part of that. But if have you thought about this and what do you see are the particular barriers in Brazil? Uh, I think the most advanced e-government e e program is at the, the federal revenue, Brazilian federal revenue. We, we have... Um, we have um, computer intelligence, and and it's pretty much efficient. Efficient, comparing to to other countries, I think this is a field that we are uh, we we've improved in the last two decades, and uh, that's that's something related with what I'm talking about. In the past two decades, our budget reform was focused on revenues, so. Uh, we improved the way the federal revenue uh, uh, deal with with people and with governments. Um, in, in these years, in this year, the the uh, my personal income, uh, I I went at it online, and it was all filled already filled with all my 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 my, my personal incomings and all my my Medicare. Uh, expenditures and uh, everything was there already, so I didn't need to to do much uh, in my in my personal income adjustments. And but we have also a challenge, and this is a common challenge here in U.S., in Brazil, in U.K., in in, in Europe. Uh, we need to deal with a new uh, form of government. Governments that are, uh, will be smarter will need uh, will need uh, pretty much uh, a short staff of people, very specialized. But machine learning is coming, and and there is no way back. And the governments will be based in intelligent computer and machine learning pretty much in the next decade. Um, in terms of education, you can provide high quality education online nowadays. So I, I was talking about uh, territorial inequality, and you can and you can even the game you you can you can provide the highest quality education for people who lives in poor areas, uh, 
besides the, the Amazon River, for example, we can, we can bring them um, to a new kind of, of education, to a new kind of relation with governments, and that's technology-based. I, I don't think we can, we can have a government in the next decade without thinking about machine learning and, and how to use that as a powerful, a powerful weapon to, to, to have a, a sustainable development. Okay, well, thank you very much, Walter. Thank you very much, Ashim, for this wonderful opening session. We will immediately switch uh, uh, those signs and go into our first panel. Uh, unfortunately, Monica de Vol is uh, fighting a very serious cold or the flu and uh, will not be able to join us this morning. She regrets very much not being here with us, but I will invite Francisco Gaetani and uh, Meg Lundsager to join here at the table.